Welcome in. I'm Eric Casillas. Springfield, Massachusetts. For me, it's the place where my parents grew up, where my cousins live, and where I go visit at the holidays. But for sports fans, specifically basketball fans, that's the place where you go see the Basketball Hall of Fame, and we now have some new members. Here are the nine inducted to the Basketball Hall of Fame class of 2020. You see those top three names. That's really your headliners, Kobe, KG, and Duncan. By the way, good middle names on all three of them. Kobe Bean Bryant, Tim Theodore Duncan, and KG's middle name is Maurice. And with that, let's say hello to our guys, Avery Johnson, Bill Ryder, Raja Bell. Great panel to discuss this really historic class of great players. And I'll start with you, Coach, collectively, all three. When you hear those three names headlining this nine-member class, you think what? Well, what I think is those guys, all three of those guys, consistently perpetuated uh, greatness uh, on the practice court, uh, in uh, during the games, but most of all, all three of those guys were what we call two-way players. You know, in this modern era of NBA basketball, we may talk about a guy like James Harden as being a great offensive player, or maybe you know another player as being a you know a terrific defensive player. But these guys played both ends of the floor. They they never really took nights off. And, you know, they weren't a guy that you can try to attack on the defensive end because they were poor defenders. And, and more than anything, they were just winners. Raja, you were a great defender among the things that you did to help your team win when you played in the NBA. Obviously, you played Kobe. That's sort of legendary. Did you often play or get switched and end up on the other two? And what did you think? Like, give me, give me a little 30 seconds on what it was like to realize that you're nose to nose with a guy who's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah, well, I, the, the other two were a little too big for me. I mean, occasionally I might get caught in a cross match, but I was never really going to go toe to toe with those guys because they were they were just b too big for me. It was a matchup uh, nightmare. But I, I just want to you know piggyback on on what Avery said. Uh, the, the the competitive spirit in each and every one of those guys is what I'll remember playing against them. Um, the numbers speak for themselves in terms of all NBAs and, you know, all NBA defensive team championships. You know, I could go on and on in terms of accolades, but you're talking about guys who every night you stepped on the court, they were coming to compete. There was a quote unquote dog in each one of those guys. Now, some of them talk more. KG had a lot of chatter when you played him. Um, Kobe and I had our moments. Timmy was relatively quiet. But they all had that competitive, winning type of spirit in them, and and it translated to the, to the championships. It, you could see it uh, on on their teammates' faces. It was something that was infectious, and they all played the game that way. Bill, how about from the media's perspective, what it was like to cover these guys? You know, I, I know what it's like from the fans' perspective. And I was saying. I have two boys who love playing hoops in the driveway. When they do like kind of the fadeaway crazy trick shot, they still yell Kobe. And anytime anybody uses the backboard, they yell Duncan. Like nobody else has ever used the backboard before or since other than Tim Duncan. From the media's perspective, what was it like with these three? Yeah, and look, uh, KG, obviously, remarkable player, uh, amazing basketball player, worthy first bout Hall of Famer. But talking to some of my colleagues around the NBA and some folks that I've covered, players and coaches, there's a universal sense for those of us that did it on the outside, particularly looking in, Kobe and Duncan were so different in so many ways, and, and yet they are linked historically, and I love their link and being inducted the same year together in the Hall of Fame as two of the greatest players in the history of the game. You throw in KG, it really is one of the great classes we've ever seen. And you narrowed it down to Kobe Bean Bryant and, and, and to Duncan, and you're talking about two guys that are arguably each. You can make an argument for each as top five, certainly top ten players. And, and to follow what Raja and Coach said, when I was in the locker room interviewing those guys, there was a remarkable intensity. You could tell you were in the presence of greatness. Now, with Kobe Bryant, it was really explicit. I've asked Kobe some, some dumb questions before, I know, because Kobe let me know that they weren't very good questions. Duncan had a quieter energy about it, but you could tell from the very beginning, certainly of my career, the level of greatness each of those guys and KG brought to the game. You knew you were in the presence of something special, and today's celebration of their careers you felt at every moment you were lucky enough as a reporter to be around it in the locker room or watching them do their thing in the arena. 
Now, Coach, we talk about, okay, what's it like to guard these guys? You actually played with Tim Duncan. So you got to see him day in, day out, you know, in the hotels, in practice, on the road. And there was this sort of sense that he was meek, even like the TV commercials where he's over at David Robinson's house. He doesn't know, okay, the gnomes are out or they're in or that kind of thing. But was that, how accurate was that? What was the other side? What was it like to be around him day in, day out? Well, Tim was, Tim was a quiet assassin, uh, even though he, he was a meek guy, but you shouldn't take his meekness for weakness, and that's what he showed on the court. Here's a guy that played for one team his entire career, played for one coach, allowed Coach Popovich to coach him as hard as anybody on the team. That set the tone for the rest of the players to follow. And uh, he dominated from day one. He dominated our first practice. And by the way, he was playing against an all defensive player in David Robinson. And we basically just gave him the keys to the car. Uh, he, he basically uh, drove us to the finals, led us to the finals. He was the MVP in the 99 finals, went on to win five uh, championships. Uh, but this guy was tough, played with a lot of tenacity. Uh, he was an unbelievable teammate, very unselfish. He knew he was the best player on the team, but he made the rest of us feel, feel special. Raja, what was underrated about one of these three guys? All right, we know the great stuff about them. We know Kobe Electric, offensive, and we know they both played two ways. We give them the guys a lot of praise, and they deserve it. But having to play against them, you may sort of pick stuff up. What did they do even better than they got credit for? Uh, well, you know, you know what's interesting? Um, you could talk about, you know, ball handling skills and shooting and, you know, Timmy, when, when I, I grew up with Tim Duncan in the Virgin Islands and I left when I was 13. Tim was my size. So he, he grew up as a guard until he started to stretch and really play. So I could tell you that he had guard skills and they were underrated because, you know, he's a power forward. But what I think all three of them were able to do and people don't really get to see that unless you're on the court is the communication that they had. Um, it, it's really important on any team. Coach can speak to that. The communication level has to be there. And all three of those guys were very communicative players with their teams. Um, you don't become all defensive players and all NBA defensive 15 times for Tim, um, 12 times for KG without being basically the quarterback of your defense. You're standing back there. You're calling. You're calling out. You're directing traffic. Um, Kobe never had a problem with grabbing a teammate and either telling him you know, what he needed to do better or how he could do it better or how he would help him do it better. Um, and when you've got leaders out there that are doing the lion's share of the work, um, it, they have to be able to communicate and they have to be able to be relatable. And I think all three of those guys did a very good job uh, of doing that on their respective teams. And, and following up on that, I'm sure you get asked, you know, what's your best sort of Kobe story or, or your best Garnett story, your best Tim Duncan story playing with these guys on the court? private moment something that maybe 10 years from now when you're sipping lemonade on a rocking chair and you sort of think back you give a little smile to yourself what's a good kobe story oh man i i had a uh you know kobe and i were into a a, a little bit of a skirmish when i was in utah and he called me with a little elbow and you know i said something back to him i think double texts were kind of served up and the ref stepped in between and you know kobe said something to the effect of like don't get in between this tonight this is just me and him i like he didn't want the rest to stop what he was about to kind of do to me. And so we went at it a whole night. Um, and he, I don't know, he might have 45 or so on me. I, I had a decent game myself, but that was a cool story for me because it just let me know what Kobe was about. This was not a guy that, um, you know, wanted anyone in between what he was going to try to do to me that night. He wanted it all to be him against me. And, and I really appreciated that. And there were plenty of nights where, you know, I was helpless and, and couldn't do anything about it. But I always respected the way he came at me and he didn't want any interference uh, in between what he was trying to get done. Bill, are there any misperceptions about any of these three guys? You're sort of our, our basketball historian and the writer and all that stuff. I know you study these guys. Are there any misperceptions about how they grew up or what they did in the NBA or what kind of game they had on or off the court with either Kobe, KG, or Timmy Duncan? Yeah, I think there is. I think there's one about Tim Duncan. And obviously, these guys are Hall of Famers, and we're celebrating them today. But as a guy that sits here in Los Angeles, that's done Los Angeles radio, you would imagine, guys, obviously, Kobe Bryant is uh, revered here. But folks in L.A., and frankly, folks beyond L.A. for a long time, I don't think folks grasp the excellence of what Duncan was about. I think it's very fair, with respect, 
to make the argument Duncan was just a little bit pl better player than Kobe or Kobe was just a little bit better player than, than Duncan. But Tim Duncan was on that level. I mean, he is one of the greatest players in the history of the game. I, I think he is the greatest power forward in the history of the game. And not that he hasn't gotten his accolades or his credit, but a lot of those years obviously spent outside of the limelight, spent his entire career in San Antonio, a couple of those championships at the back end of his career. I don't think over the course of his playing days, Tim Duncan was celebrated the way that a, a Kobe Bryant was necessarily by the general NBA fan, the way that a Michael Jordan was, the way that a LeBron James was, a Magic Johnson. And, and for me, at least, I think he's in that class. So it's, you know, I think one of the misperceptions, and, and these things get cured by things like being in the Hall of Fame, is just how amazing Tim Duncan was in a vacuum, quiet or otherwise, flashy or otherwise, gnomes in his front yard or otherwise. He can, uh, he can hold his head in any room with any NBA player in the history of the game. Yeah, I, I like that you said that because my always argument whenever I've had radio arguments or whatever about Tim Duncan is I say, how many guys can argue legitimately that they're on the all-time team at their position, right? If you're a guard, it's Jordan. That's about it, you know, if you're the shooting guard. But how many guys can say, I'm the all-time center, I'm the all-time power forward? Tim Duncan can make that claim that he's the all-time four on the all-time NBA team, which is quite remarkable. Uh, Coach, what did he mean for that area in San Antonio when you were there? This is a guy who didn't leave. This is a guy that never sought, you know, said, I need to have my own thing. I, I can have guys like Ginobili and Tony Parker. I can have the coach be a big star in this town, and we can just go out and win. What did he mean to that community? Tim meant so much to the city of San Antonio, uh, especially after we lost in 1995. A lot of people don't remember. We were 62 and 20, had the best record in the NBA, defeated the Rockets five times in the regular season, and we lost in 1995, and that was the year that Hakeem was the MVP, and we sat in the locker room, and we were devastated. We didn't know when we were going to get back. But man, when that ping pong ball came up with us having a number one pick in 97 and, and Tim Duncan joined us, we thought we had a chance to win uh, multiple championships, which obviously has happened, but that it was going to be in San Antonio, not in Los Angeles or Philadelphia or Boston, some large uh, uh, major market, but, but in San Antonio to a group of people that needed to be motivated uh, in a culture that was so uh, much in support uh, their team through especially all of the bad times so he, he meant so much to the city of San Antonio the entire state of Texas and uh, that's why he's gonna forever be a legend and let's wrap it up here Raja you, you know you can take Kobe Bryant here and if someone just said to you Kobe Bryant was and fill in the blank What's your best way to sort of encapsulate a guy that you played against, you had rivalries with? There were nights you, you know, you got the better of him. There were nights he got the better of you. Um, he was the ultimate warrior. Um, you know, I, I could use champion, but I don't really know that that sums it up. He, this guy was just a warrior. You can find you know, endless pictures of Kobe with broken fingers and and shooting free throws with torn Achilles and and ice bags up and down his whole body. He, he was a warrior. And because he was a warrior, not just, you know, on the court, but on the practice court, in the weight room, um, you know, working on whatever skill it was that he wanted to master to come back and be able to use in his arsenal the following year. He, he just was a warrior, wore it on his sleeve. He, he was never satisfied with, with what he was or what his team was at that time. And because of that spirit and that attitude, he was able to become a champion and the Lakers were able to be able champions time and time again. But he, he was just a warrior, man. Any night you played Kobe, whether he was coming off of an injury, whether he was coming off of a, a, a layoff, it didn't matter. You had to strap up and be ready to go because he was coming at you. And he, he suffered no fools. He took no prisoners. He was coming at your neck. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your perspective. These are three guys that took very different roads and ultimately all end up in Springfield on the first ballot. Thank you so much. And again, when you're looking at this and you see the nine uh, inductees for the 2020 Hall of Fame, but the top three is where a lot of that attention is going to fall. And you see there really is different roads. Quiet guys, vocal guys. Uh, Kobe and Kevin Garnett went right from high school. Tim Duncan played all four years 
at Wake. When's the next time a first ballot Hall of Famer is going to play four years of college? Well, Tim Duncan did that. So different, different ways to get there. But the destination, Springfield Hall of Fame, the same. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.